Um, yeah, because I need to read the chat. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, are you the host? Yeah, I want to judge my Here. You're the host, right? Me? Yeah. Oh, oh, it's Bante the host. Bante is. Bante is the host. Okay. Yes, Bante, I'm here. Okay. Any so far, no more questions? Um just just give me one minute, Bante. Okay, Bante. Um, we have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. To offer dana or do good deeds, expecting good karma back, is that good or bad? Uh, it is uh, not bad, but not very good also. Because if you expect anything in return, then your dana... Uh, benefit of dana would become weak and therefore in order to make it a dana you should not expect even a thank you just give you can give dana to uh, monastic hospitals poor people animals, destitute, anyone you can give without expecting anything in return. Suppose you give something to a beggar, destitute, homeless person, what can we expect from them? <laughs> you don't expect anything, you just give. Similarly, when you give something to Monastics, what can we expect from them? Mat nothing material, but spiritual upliftment. And when you give something like that, then any time and every time you think about it, you will be very, very happy. If you expect something in return, if you don't get it, you will be unhappy. 
it is just like giving something to a friend. Uh, you give a uh, lunch to a friend for three, three, four, five times. If the friend doesn't give you any lunch any time, then you begin to think, gee, I have given him lunch for five times. <laughs> he never invited me. <laughs> Don't you think so? Because we expect something from the friend. Giving dana is not like that. You give and finish. Don't let your right hand know what the left hand does. That kind of sort of anonymous uh, giving is the real, real giving. No expecting anything. That's a very good giving. If you expect it, give something, expecting something in return, uh, that may not be very good, but not totally bad. But uh, you are giving a string attached. A string attached, you see, see, see. So uh, that's all I have to say. Oh, okay, the next question. Yes, the next question is, how can one let go of anger at somebody you hate? This man slept with my wife and broke our marriage and family. But this hatred is just hurting me. So if somebody's wronged you in a very major way, then naturally the inclination of the mind is hatred. How can you let go of that hatred, which you know is hurting you, but you still feel it? Feel it. How, do you, how do you do that? How do you let go of hatred in that case? Well, uh, if you hate something, uh, first of all, you must learn not to hate by how you do that, you have to look at yourself and ask yourself, uh, by hating, I uh, hurt myself. I hurt myself. And uh, I make myself unhealthy. I make myself suffer. And moreover, uh, the person who did something to you may be not in a very good mental state. The person might have done, <clears throat> might have had some previous problems, uh, health issues, and losing someone, losing job, something like that the person may have, or may some a person might have brought up in a very unfriendly family situation. And this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, where, he, where that person expresses that previous bitter experience. And therefore, it is uh, first you have to advise yourself, and then you let your head, your anger subside, and try to practice patience and patience and patience, then practice metta, kindness, uh, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity. All the four Brahmaviharas you can practice when you practice one of them. Suppose you practice metta, loving friendliness, all others also will join it, and all the four Brahmiyaras naturally you practice. That is very good for your own mental health. And then it will be very easy to forgive the other person who did something to hurt you instead of developing hatred. Okay? Thank you, Bhante. That, that is my... Uh that is my advice. This is the advice that uh, Buddha has given us many, many times uh, in his discourses. Okay? The next question relates to the first question about dana, about giving. 
-huh. How does your answer to this first question relate to the idea of merit for others? So when you give to the monastic community and you give um, to have merit, for example, departed ones and things like that, how does that idea of merit relate to dana? How does it relate to dana? Why? To dana, to giving. How does yeah. merit relate to giving? I think that is a very important question. Dana is... Uh, you found find in the central teachings of the Buddha, like uh, you know, uh, noble eightfold path. Uh, number one is understanding. Number two is right thinking. What is the right thinking? Thinking or letting go. Next come sankap. Next second right thought is. Avyapada Sankap, non hatred, that is loving friendliness. And number three is Avinsa Sankap, the practice of uh, compassion. So letting go, loving friendliness and compassion are called three wholesome thought. Now letting go is definitely related to Dharma. Dharma means letting go. As I mentioned earlier, you let go of your greed, uh, attachment, clinging to something that you view away, and that you develop always in your mind, then that would help you to give up your desire, which is the cause of suffering. Then that helps you to liberate yourself even from samsaric suffering. And therefore, dana is the number one practice mentioned in the Buddha's teaching. And that is how it relates to dhamma, dhamma practice. When you practice meditation, you have to let go. Let go of your clean craving. Otherwise, you cannot develop your meditation. Let go of your greed, hatred, and delusion. Otherwise, you cannot develop a mindfulness. And therefore, all pivots around giving. And uh, all are related to the noble eightfold path. <coughs> okay? Thank you, Bhante. The next question is um, in a phrase where it says, the first end is contact. The second end is the origin of contact. And the middle is the cessation of contact. What is mean by the second um, being the, uh, ces the, um, the cessation of contact? Is it the six senses or is it the entire factors of the dependent origination that happen before contact? Now, Uh, contact is actually the uh, another source of the rest of uh, mental factors. For instance, as soon as the eyes, visual objects, meet, then consciousness arises. When these three combine together, contact arises. As soon as contact arises, there is a uh, feeling arises. This feeling can be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, and then can arise attachment. If the sensation is pleasant, the attachment arises. If the pleasant sensation is unpleasant, detachment, resentment arises. If the sensation is neutral, confusion can arise. And therefore, uh, everything starts uh, rolling after uh, uh, con after you have uh, come in contact with something, with eyes, uh, you know, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought. These are the sensory objects. When you, co when you contact them, then arises, then everything triggers, and then they begin to activate. And therefore, contact is very important uh, factor in uh, all uh, 
the you know 62 views uh, arise from the contract uh, Buddha has mentioned that in the uh, Brahmajala Sutta in Dhrikanikaya and therefore a contract in that sense is very very important in the dependent origination uh, first end is the uh, contract second end is the origin the origination of contract and then you said you said the the middle is a cessation of contract well when you understand the contract and uh, whatever else entails the contract and when you understand it very clearly you try to not to let others arise in your mind when contact arises. This contact, all human beings, all living beings, even the enlightened persons have contact. What, what they have very great uh, mental training, purity, clarity in the mind, to not to get carried away with what happened after contact. Uh, so the that's what we have to do. Okay. Thank next you, Bhante. Yes. The next question the person says, Thank you for your kindness and compassion. This person has four questions, so I will read them to you one at a time and let you answer them one at a time. Okay. So starting with the first question. Referring to Anusaya, the latent tendencies that you explained last week, I noticed I noted the Chinese Agama translated Anusaya as a compound word that constitutes habits and smell. I wonder in the Kali Panan, Anusaya is being translated as habits and smells too. Right, I mentioned it. Uh, I gave examples last time. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, it is a word as a, uh, as far as grammar goes. It is compound word. Anu plus saya. Anu plus saya. Anu means in accordance with, or together with, along with, or while. Saya means sleeping, lying down. So this lies down, Anusaya, lies down in our subconscious mind as a habit coming from previous uh, practices, previous, before we become monks and nuns, uh, you have it and then when you become monk or nun, you continue this habit. And also, when you in in your previous life you have some habits and those habits will come to this life as anusaya. I mentioned only the Buddha did not have anusaya uh, when he attained full enlightenment, but all other arahants can have anusaya. I mentioned one, uh, I, I gave you two examples. Uh, one was uh, a monk, uh, his name is Pilin the Watcher. He always called others outcast, 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 or oh, untouchable, 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 uh, wasala, wasala. <clears throat> Even if a person, according to the tradition, a high caste person came, this monk called him uh, outcast, sit down, outcast, where are you going? Outcast, do this and that. So people got offended and reported to the Buddha and Buddha said, yes, you know, this monk has been a high class person for 500 lifetimes and therefore this he brought this as his anusaya, samsari habit. Another example I gave you last time was a monk who went on uh, arms round with a big arms ball and collected a lot of food. 
arms were all, all full of food and he ate all of it. And then he was looking around for more food uh, because he has uh, insatiable hunger. So this was reported to the Buddha. Buddha said, this monk has been uh, an elephant in his previous life. Elephants is, uh, you know, tons of uh, uh, leaves, grass, nuts, fruits, and so forth every day. So this monk has been uh, an elephant, and this is the elephant's habit. And sometimes some monks uh, have become uh, monkeys for many uh, previous life. In this life, they uh, like to be a after even attainment of enlightenment, their behavior can be like uh, monkey, like that. These are called anusaya, uh, underlying tendencies, underlying, under in subconscious mind, lying, and remaining uh, in uh, in a, in a subtle way. Okay. Next question. Uh, yes, uh, the, the person was also asking if there is any connection with the sense of smell. For example, uh, Anusaya being related to um, more awareness of order. Now, uh, this is a, a mental state, and if somebody uh, has this. Uh, what do you call uh, smell? Uh, I have no any particular example to give, uh, but uh, when I after I gave two other examples, you can understand if somebody has this uh, smell all the time, uh, perhaps that can either be some uh, sinus problem. For instance, some people have sinus problem and they always smell uh, some unpleasant smell. Uh, unpleasant smell because some uh, because of the sinus problem. If, the, if there is nothing of that sort, if they have another uh, smell, Say, for instance, uh, uh, perfume smells and so forth, and always wherever he goes, perhaps he might have had some uh, unusual remaining from his previous life. But I don't have any particular example to uh, give you to make it clear. But this is what I assume. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Next question. Uh the next question is uh, that you mentioned last last week that metta is a mental construct um, that it's also impermanent, unsatisfactory, and non-self. And the person wonders if uh, why do we still need to send metta to ourselves and to all being, given that in essence there is no self. So if there is no self, why send metta? Of course. Uh, we practice metta even though it is uh, impermanent. Uh, we practice metta in order to calm ourselves, to reduce our resentment, anger, and as I mentioned earlier in uh, answering the uh, first question, yes, we practice metta because it is a, a universal practice, uh, a boundless practice. Uh, it has uh, tremendous uh, benefit, especially if we become calm, relaxed, and peaceful. Of course, calmness is not permanent, relaxation is not permanent, but it doesn't matter in, uh, in our, uh, anything conventional, anything mundane is uh, impermanent. But even if you attain supreme enlightenment, uh, you develop, uh, you have uh, this uh, uh, four Brahma Vihara. Uh, even the Buddha, who had attained full enlightenment, he, had, he was an embodiment of compassion. 
But it doesn't mean that compassion is permanent. But one who one who attained enlightenment can easily develop this, easily use his uh, natural compassion, natural metta, natural appreciative joy, and natural equanimity. For instance, when Venerable uh, Sariputta gave us Dhamma Saman, Venerable Dhamma Dinda gave us Dhamma Saman, Buddha appreciated it and uh, he praised them uh, because of uh, because he didn't have any jealousy. Uh, he had uh, he had uh, uh, appreciative joy. So they express this. Uh, it doesn't mean that what they express is permanent, but this is in conventional sense. We had to live in the ordinary society with uh, ordinary people, and ordinary people uh, need uh, uh, appreciation, compassion, equanimity, and so forth. Uh, and therefore, this is very high altruistic practice. So there, therefore, uh, even though it is impermanent, we still need to practice to make society peaceful and happy uh, and make them comfortable. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. The next question is, the end of the body is death and the end of the mind is Nibbana. Under this context, in respect to relics, it puzzles me somewhat when um, somewhat, even though I like to venerate them. Uh, the question is um, that since there is no self, why uh, the Buddha, Arahants and well-practicing monks still leave behind relics? Wouldn't it be that their respective body and mind, including relics, have vanished without a trace when they entered uh, Paranibbana. So why is there this practice of relics when we understand uh, that there is no self and they have no self? So why why do we encase relics and venerate relics? Well, uh, relics, relics don't have self. You don't have self. Nobody has self. So self has nothing to do Self-concept has nothing to do with respect in the relics. Now, uh, relics themselves cannot do anything. Uh, when some, when an enlightened person is passed away, his body will be cremated. After cremation, there may be uh, some little, some parts of uh, bones uh, remaining. They they collect and people out of respect, they use their, uh, in their shrines, uh, in their caskets, they build up pagodas and so forth uh, in order to arouse their sadha, faith, confidence, and uh, uh, trust in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Buddha has, when he was uh, uh, going to pass away, uh, he said, there are uh, objects of veneration. Sari Rika Uddesika Pari Bhogika. Sari Rika means the parts of the body after they are dead, or uh, bones after their uh, cremation. Pari uh, Sari Rika. Uddesika means those uh, things that uh, Buddhas. Uh, use like a body tree. Uh, Paribhoga means things that they have used like arms, ball, robes, and so forth. If people take them and respect, uh, that would help them to uh, develop their sadha, faith, confidence. Other than that, they particularly themselves don't cannot do anything. They cannot perform miracles, although some people believe in that. No relics can perform any miracle, uh, but they are just a piece of bones and so forth after cremation. And these sort of things remain of any person, whether the person was enlightened or not. Even today, if you see after cremation, there may remain some uh, pieces. 
and they they take them and they you know respect if they like. Even today, they uh, build pagodas and uh, certain monks uh, passed away. Uh, certain enlightened, enlightened monks or enlightened nuns passed away. They do that. That is, they are there in order to uh, remember them, respect them, respect the person who whose born whose relics uh, is left behind. Uh, Buddha's relics, Arahant's relics. Uh, and so forth, they, uh, they do that uh, out of respect. But the relics, Buddha's relics, Aran's relics, themselves cannot do anything to us except our deep faith, confidence, trust in them. And, you know, when I remember when you respect somebody and you ask the person to give the person something to remember. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, some people coming here and asking me to give some you know, nails that I cut or hair from my head for them to take and respect. That is just for their own attitude. Uh, they are they are respect, but they, those things have nothing to do with the spiritual uh, growth. Okay. Yes. The next two questions are advice questions. So the first one is, uh, what should a practitioner do if they are sick? So the person is not feeling well. You're sick. How do you deal with that as part of your practice? I think that's a good question. Yes, uh, yesterday in my Dharma talk, I mentioned this. When you're healthy uh, and uh, alone, uh, you must practice uh, your Dharma meditation more ardently, and more vigorously, uh, apply more effort, you keep practicing before you fall sick. And you know, all, we all can fall sick anytime. And therefore, when we are healthy, we must make haste to uh, practice our meditation. Every moment we have time, every available moment, we use for the practice. That's what you. However, in spite of all these things, a person or sick, even in the sick state, so long as the person is conscious and uh, uh, tolerate a certain uh, amount of pain, then one try to practice meditation. Perhaps when the person practice meditation, he can recover faster uh, along with the uh, you know, prescribed medicine doctors uh, asking to take care of certain uh, treatment, of food, rest, via exercise, while doing all these things. You, Whenever you cannot do any of these things, even in your lie down in your bed, you meditate. Focus your mind on your breathing and breathe deeply and deep breathe out deeply and pay attention to the the nerves vibrating as you breathe in and out and uh, you can make yourself calm relaxed and therefore that would help you to recover maybe quickly uh, rather than getting agitated excited angry and uh, you know, yawning, mourning, and accusing anybody when they are sick. When you are sick, you don't all do any of these negative things. Think of positive things. Think of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, morality, and meditate. And perhaps uh, you can recover very easily, uh, faster, uh, with the medicine and so forth. 
Okay. Yes. Next the, the yeah. next question is, uh, if a person has all the conditions to meditate, so they, they have the time and they have a suitable environment, um, what's your advice? How many hours, how many times a day and how long should they practice meditation when they have everything suitable for meditation around them? Actually, if one has all these things available, uh, uh, environment, food, uh, time, and all this, uh, having done all the uh, regular, basic, most essential things, rest of the time you meditate. Sitting, walking, lying down, uh, you meditate. Uh, so your mind will always be preoccupied with uh, uh, meditation practice, uh, meditation experience. Uh, you experience uh, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness, and you practice your letting go, the practice of detachment. Uh, uh, I have, have patience, uh, practice of loving friendliness, all these wholesome things you can use. Uh, any object you like to practice, you like to use, you can use it as your object of med meditation. Uh, so anytime, there is no specific time. Uh, you can time uh, at uh, one hour, two hours, three hours at a time and then have a break as long as you like to have a practice and have some break, uh, water break, toilet break, uh, arms, I mean a food break and so forth, uh, as, you know, attending to very essential chores. For these things you have a break and the rest of the time you meditate. It's not, it doesn't matter. There is no limit. I think this is what the Buddha advised the monks uh, to do uh, because they had plenty of time. And similarly, if one has that much time, uh, they can do, the ex do exactly the same thing as uh, uh, monastic does. Okay, uh friends. I think uh, you ask me very, very good questions. You know, time passes so quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I like your question very much. And I appreciate your enthusiasm and continue asking. I think there are more questions you can ask them. Yeah, we can ask them next time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Chaturi, for reading this question. Now, let us meditate, okay? Okay. 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 May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, <clears throat> weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth, May all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere. Neither from anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another. As a mother would risk her own life to protect her only child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless loving friendliness. Above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hatred or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake, one should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here. 
not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision, removing desire for sensual pleasures, one comes never again to birth in the womb. With this uh, metta recital, keeping this metta in your mind, we uh, practice meditation for the next uh, 25 minutes at least. Okay.
by means of this meritorious deed, may I never join with the foolish, may I join with always wise until thy attainable banner. May the suffering be free from suffering, may the fear struck be free from fear, may the grieving be free from grief, so too may all beings be. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest, may all beings arisen in this realm, with form and without form, with perception and without perception, be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, friends, let me conclude this. Uh, sharing. Now I want to share a metta with everyone. All those who are in hospitals, suffering from various diseases, taken care of by doctors, nurses and hospital staff, may they recover very soon and try to understand Dhamma, practice Dhamma, practice meditation and attain liberation from suffering. May the doctors, nurses, and lawyers, uh, and hospital staff also find time to practice metta, practice dhamma, understand the nature of dhamma, nature of life. I think they are in a better situation as they are working with very sick people and they understand dhamma, can understand dhamma very quickly, easily. And may they find time to practice Dhamma and attain liberation. If they are listening to this uh, very earnest wish, please try to practice. And then, all those who are in uh, trouble spots, war zones, various problems uh, all over the world, more and more problems are arising in the world. I don't need to mention countries, and we all are aware of that. May they all find time to understand the suffering they inflict and those who are subject to infliction, suffering. And may they all find time to understand human nature understand the suffering and practice meditation and share their loving friendliness and stop their violence and practice Dhamma and attain liberation. Again, may all those who are in the northern direction, northeastern direction, eastern direction, Southeastern direction, southern direction, southwestern direction, western direction, northwestern direction, e oh, above, below, and all around us. In all these ten directions, all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. This alone, this thought alone, is very helpful to all of us and we all practice Dhamma, understand the nature, understand the suffering, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness and attain Nibbana, liberation from suffering. Okay. That's yeah. all, friends, I can do now. Yeah, do. I'll see you next week. Thank you very much, Bante. Thank you, 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 Bante. Yes. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante.